uh, we are very privileged to have uh, a group of people who want to share their thoughts on the whole question of a shared society and the need uh, to build prosperity out of our diversity and out of our reconciliation. And just as I find them seated, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, closest to me uh, is Mr. Tom Daly. Uh, Tom is a former president of the Ulster Council of the GA. Uh, and over the past decade, uh, Tom led some very pioneering work within, within the Gaelic Athletic Association, reaching out to marginalised communities and building on the whole question and concept of respect within sport and culture and between sports and cultures. Beside Tom is uh, Duncan Morrow. Uh, Duncan is the Chief Executive of the Community Relations Council, and I think uh, for any of you in local government uh, or even at regional level, uh, we will know that Duncan's uh, influence on uh, community relations policy and community relations practice in our region is immense. Uh, beside Duncan, I do believe, yes, we have uh, Dr. Norman Hunt, uh, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Uh, a man who uh, lives in North Belfast, and I know from having the privilege of getting to speak to him privately on many occasions, feels as passionate, passionately about the issues of social exclusion and social marginalisation in North Belfast as he does about the need to build peace and reconciliation across our region and our island. The lady beside Norman, of course, needs no introduction. She is the formidable uh, and wonderful uh, SDLP MLA, Dolores Kelly, uh, a woman who brought the parade bill to its knees and now has her eyes set on the cohesion, sharing and integration strategy. And finally, on, on the extreme right, is uh, Colin Harvey, who ironically uh, uh, shouldn't really be there because he's no stranger to most of us in this hall, and this will not be his first time to address an SDLP conference. But Colin is bringing to this morning's conversation uh, his expertise as, uh, I would suggest, the leading human rights lawyer in this region, uh, as a professor at Queen's, uh, and as a member of the Human Rights Commission. So we meet, meet this morning a uh, conference in a, in a European city in the capital of a region of Ireland, a place which has its own destiny in its own hands. And that is because of the SDLP, because we have felt for generations that without the consent of people, no nation or region can change its course. And I sit, uh, thanks to you, in an assembly which is built on the basic principles of partnership and reconciliation. And that great White House in the Hill stands uh, out to many of the younger generation as a symbol of a new Northern Ireland. Ironically, it stands to them nearly as opposite to what it stands to some older people. To many of previous generations, it stands for a unionist misrule, uh, for a Protestant parliament, for a Protestant people. And yet, when I meet young people coming through the doors uh, into the Great Hall on Monday and Tuesdays, uh, they don't want a history lesson. They're not looking for me to give them a lecture or the discourse of Irish nationalism. They want to know what we are going to do with the power that has been devolved to us and how we are going to build a reconciled region and a reconciled island. But sectarianism and the legacy of conflict does linger in the blue benches of this chamber in Stormont. And the politics of division all too often is choking the possibility of prosperity and partnership. And this is something that we, as a party, need to have the courage to confront. The executive is failing our young generation, it's failing business and workers too. But most of all, it's failing those who have least. It's failing the most marginalised and the poorest in our society. It is a sad irony that the people who suffered the most during the worst years of our conflict are yet to see a genuine dividend from our decade of peace. Leadership, and this party could write a book on it, must be about more than just protectionism. If you want to just be a gatekeeper for your people or your community, you are betraying the very point of leadership. Because protectionism ultimately feeds prejudice. And it allows difference to become the issue rather than opportunity. That's why we are so annoyed with the proposed cohesion sharing and integration strategy. It's why we believe it sells us all as people short. And it is why we believe 
but it should be there and we should start over again. There can be conference. No good relations without equality and there can be no equality without good relations. If we think that all we need is a statute book full of rights and we will be fulfilled as a people, well then we are delusional. Those rights mean nothing if they do not open up the opportunity for changed relationships. And they mean nothing if they are to be seen simply as something with which to contest against the other side. That is the type of thinking that is all too prevalent in the cohesion sharing and integration strategy. It is the thinking of conflict, by another means, in another place, but conflict nonetheless. But that thinking has another dangerous spin-off. And we saw it last night, a few miles from here, when two police officers serving this community, every single one of us, um, were victims of a blast bomb. I understand they're well and I'm sure you will want to send conferences, best wishes to them for a speedy recovery. It is the type of thinking that is fueling distance. It is the type of thinking that allows certain people with blinker politics to try and pursue an alternative to the democratic peaceful media. And it is an inherited mindset, inherited from people who believe that politics can be exclusivist, that it is okay to pursue a political agenda based on the basic principle that if you do not ascribe, you do not belong. Back in 71, John Hume warned about this type of politics. He pointed out then that anything that it simply reduces politics to the ascendancy of one tradition over another will fail. And it only leads to one place, and that is the grave. And friends, I think in 2010, we must never, ever forget that. And we must never forget that central to who we are as a party and to why we are here as a movement is the fact that we never believed that politics was an exclusive thing, that identity was something that excluded you rather than included you. That we always rejected the basic concept that if you do not ascribe, you do not believe, belong, could possibly be a way forward. Our vision is for a united people. It has been forever. And we believe that that unity is only possible through reconciliation. And it is for that reason that I think it is so important that we gather here today with a panel as diverse as we have assembled. Because it is time that we lead again the conversation about the true value and opportunity of reconciliation to our people, to our region, and to our island. The fact that if we are genuine about unlocking the prosperity within us, we must build respect within and between the diversity that makes us. Thank you very much for listening to me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw the first question to Norman Hamilton. Norman. <laughs> You've spoken this week. Does that mean that I, that I have to be awake? But okay, where you go? Yes, you have to be awake. Um, you said earlier this week that uh, separate but equal wasn't good enough. Why? Separate but equal reinforces our fears. And for me, the big issue for this conference, for the, indeed for every political party, for the whole of society, is that at the moment we are simply seeking to manage fear rather than addressing fear and for example as long as we remain separate and divided then the fears that we have of somebody else or some other group or some other tribe are simply uh, left in place or are even reinforced so for me uh, I want to say to conference and then I want to say to wider society let's get real and address our fears um, face them rather than simply ignore them or manage them. Tom, respect is at the heart of positive sportsmanship. Uh, it's the thing you're told before you put on a jersey and go out to represent any uh, team in any code at any level. What have you learned over the past five or six years about the need to promote and build respect in our society? 
Well, I suppose from a, a, a GA point of view in Ulster, the fact that uh, as a governing body of the Ulster Council, we, we have to work in two jurisdictions, we have to work uh, with two different sets of government departments in order to bring forward development for our, our organisation. Uh, we need to confront these sort of issues because the overall framework of the GA obviously um, uh, doesn't get down to that level of detail. So as we began concentrating on a uh, development strategy in terms of, of defining what it was we wanted to do in this province, uh, the reality of, of the division in society was of course staring us in the face. Even the reality maybe of how the GA in the past uh, interacted with or didn't interact with uh, the system here. And in the context of visiting all of that, we, we saw the need for uh, developing um, a community outreach program. And uh, our experience of that is that as we have engaged and have been prepared, I suppose, to put out the hand of friendship, um, we have found increasingly that there is a, a welcoming response for that. And, and um, uh, both internally within our own organisation and uh, with parts of society maybe that we wouldn't have a very strong interface with uh, in the past. So uh, what, what I maybe have come to learn about that whole uh, respect agenda is that it's something you have to be conscious of, but you also have to be in a position to maintain a consistent effort and focus on it. And I suppose that's one of the difficulties for, for a large amateur uh, sporting and cultural organisation. There are so many different parts to what we do. Uh, to, to maintain a focus on that kind of work does require, I believe, um, 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 resources, uh, consistent effort, and, and, and I think uh, into the future, um, growing and, 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 and strengthening relationships with other people of like mind from other parts of society. Could you help us unpick, I suppose, the importance of the statute book but whether or not you think that the statute book really is just a lever to society or an end in itself. Good morning, everyone, first of all. Uh, I'd just like to answer that question by you know, addressing the, the, the idea of a shared society itself. And I see it as a, a helpful term, but I also see it as, as a new term as well and a new concept. A new concept that involves the fusion of rights, equality, uh, right relationships and social social justice. I suppose the starting point in this conversation for me has been this is the you know the 40th anniversary of the of the SDLP, and I think that the question that we have to ask ourselves this morning in terms of the the shared society agenda is what sort of society do we want to live in in 2050 in 40 years. From now, and one of the frustrations I think I'm sure everyone feels is the lack of proper focused discussion on the sort of shared society we want to see in 40 years' time. In terms of uh, law, I will confess to, to, to being involved in, in that area, and lawyers get uh, a, a hard time, and on many occasions, understandably so. But uh, I think that law is there to facilitate the changes in society and help them on their way. What we do not want to create in this society is a culture of litigation, but we want to create a culture in this society of rights, respect and responsibility, and the law can help us on our way to build on that. I'd just like to say one thing more, however, in relation to that, you know, Connell mentioned the list of, of instruments that we already have, but I've scribbled down on my piece of paper all the things that we do not have and that were promised. Remember that Good Friday Agreement, uh, that constitutional moment that promised not just a managed future, but a shared future and a shared society with the sort of shared society sketched out. What happened to our single equality bill? What happened to our Bill of Rights? What happened to our All-Ireland Charter of Rights? What happened to our Assembly Committee dedicated to looking at things like rights and equality? So there's a lot there, progress has been made, but there's much, much more to be done. Duncan, um, you're just
job is to is to promote community relations, and you you head up the the organisation charged with it. Do you think CSI is going to let you or whatever body would emerge for it to do the necessary job? Well, I suppose let's start with one thing, which is this is a really important debate. So, in some sense or other, we have to welcome the fact that it's now in the public domain, and it is one which everybody, I think, has to take part in. And I, I really welcome the fact that the SDLP is taking the lead in, in, in setting up this conversation because how we decide this is really important. It, the CSI document as it comes out for us has a, we have a whole lot of concerns, I suppose, really about what's in the core of that document. At the first level, it appears to say just getting a document out is okay and say that's enough success, we're great, we, we, we had nothing before, now we've done that. I have to say it really doesn't do justice to the amount of international and local and community effort that has been done up to now. The, the blunt reality of living in Ireland, north and in the border region particularly, uh, Northern Ireland, has been that over three billion pounds was invested in peace building in the last 25 years by the international community. Two billion from the European Union, about three quarters of a, of, a mil, of a billion from the International Fund for Ireland. People like Atlantic Philanthropies and so on throwing the money in. We have never really focused on this stuff. And this document doesn't even do the justice of reviewing where we've got to and where we need to go. So for me, the first basic starting point is we need to take stock of where we've got to and where we want to go and I don't think the document does enough justice to that. The second point I would make at this point is, you know, talking simply on the old subject of what we used to call sectarianism but the real divide is between us. I don't think the document is really serious about the scale and scope of what we're talking about here. We talk about this as if it's some kind of attitudinal problem, people don't like each other in their houses. I have to tell you, in my experience, this is not just about superficial attitudes. This is a historic legacy with which we are grappling and with which now for the first time we might have a historic opportunity to deal with and we have to take it because it won't come round again, certainly not for this generation. So the key issue is that we don't miss this opportunity because it doesn't come twice with that level of international support and investment. But we're talking about a historic legacy, not just of 40 years, but of generations and of centuries, which we now have a chance to, to write a different chapter in. Second thing, it's written into the structures of everything we do. We're having a debate about education, which is in danger of turning into the wrong kind of debate. Instead of saying, how do we educate our children for a shared society? It's all about, you want my schools, you're not getting my schools, and that kind of uh, zero-sum game again. We need to talk about how we do justice to what parents need, and how we do justice to making a society where everybody belongs. But that's a small example. The housing system, the public housing system, the bottom line is we have a theory of equality. But if a house becomes available in the wrong place, who's opting for it? That is not equality. That is actually a sense that only certain houses are open to you. We have to change the notion that just because you're, and let's use it to make it less simple, you've got a black face, you can't live here. If we said that internationally, we would be an international pariah. And yet we have that as a normality in our public system when it comes to sectarianism and housing. So in the structures. And then when people talk about, oh, you're all high level. Well, let me tell you, it's at people's very basic decisions. It's in where can you live, where can you go, what can you say, what's, what football jersey can you wear, uh, exactly what do you risk at night. All these very basic decisions. When I talk to young people in Lurgan, they tell me, and Dolores and me have had a long conversation about this. The bottom line is, as far as I can tell, most of the Catholic young people don't want to go to what is probably the best park in Europe certainly in the evenings, and most of the Protestant young people don't want to go to McDonald's because it's in the wrong part of the town. There isn't a cinema. Why? Because you know something, there isn't a shared space that's big enough for it so everybody goes to the other places. This has serious effects on this generation, on this generation. And finally, then surprisingly, on the back of that and the experience of violence and the number of victims we have and the sense of fear, funny enough, people have some attitudes. Well, you know something? 
For me, CSI needs to be of that scale and scope. And I suppose my fundamental issue with the CSI is it doesn't deal with that. And I'll say one last thing, and I know you'll want to get on to somebody else, because as you know, I could talk for a really hard on this topic. <laughs> the bottom line uh, problem is we need to... We, I, my line here now is we have more pilots than Ryanair. We, we have done a lot of piloting. We actually need to move this into a system question. And the point about CSI is it needs to stop saying we're going to do a few more pilots. And it needs to say, if this is a society which is beginning to move from <coughs> terminal hostility to a place of we are going to share this future one way or another, and that is a core commitment to each other, then you know something, it has to be about things like housing. It has to be a thing about education. But above all in this day and age, it's about economics. People who think that we're going to get investment in here, while our signature weakness is, if you come here you might be at risk, are kidding themselves. It is not surprising that tourism in the north, in Northern Ireland, runs at what, roughly a tenth per capita of what it does in the south. And it's not all about the weather. The bottom line is, if we have riots every summer, you know something, the local people leave and the Nobody else comes in. That is not a way to build a small service industry economy. We can't do that. And then when you're talking about poverty, you know something? I know that uh, poverty creates sectarianism. It definitely does. But let's turn it the other way around. You know something? Sectarianism deeply creates poverty. Because there is no mechanism to get people to invest in places where it simply looks scary and frightening. You cannot attract investment. If we want our children and our brightest people to come and live here, then this needs to be an attractive place to live. The quality of life matters to us. If our universities are to lead creating a global economy, we need to be able to attract the type of research and the kind of things that we need to bring here. This is not a marginal question. If you're talking economics and you're talking poverty, the bottom line at the moment is if you live near an interface and you get up and go, and you get up and go. And these places remain deeply, deeply impoverished. People say to me all the time, community relations, middle class chattering issue. I have to tell you, the people who are paying the price in this community for sectarianism are not middle class and they're not chattering. There are people who are living in the worst, most impoverished areas of this community. So an anti-poverty strategy, which does not seriously tackle the, 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 um, the issues of how we get jobs into places which are currently not jobs, is, is not serious. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Duncan. Sum that up, what you're saying is that if there, if there is prosperity to be found in our diversity, there's only poverty to be found in segregation. Yep. And when it comes to the CSI uh, policy, Dolores, it'll be your job on behalf of us all at the OFM DFM committee to, to deal with this uh, piece of policy. What's your message to conference about what we need to do politically in the Assembly about this particular policy? Well, uh, uh, can I just say? Colin Duncan, which isn't easy at the best of times. Uh, I was very grateful that Duncan came up to Lurgan because people will know that the Lurgan and North Lurgan in particular and parts of Drumbeg actually is an area where there have been young people involved in street violence as a precursor to actually draw them into uh, distant republicanism. And uh, very grateful for the work that uh, Duncan and others are currently doing alongside uh, the SELB and trying to meet the needs of some of those young people because. Uh, I actually had meetings on a cross-party basis to highlight to the council because youth are not the statutory responsibility of councils, but yet it was having a detrimental impact on the economic investment of the time because people are not coming to see it on their screen. So that's a very good example of how uh, the, the failure to deal with sectarianism and the, the uh, violence is having an impact on the life of everyone in that area. But in terms of the CSI, it was interesting, I don't know if many of you saw Hearts and Minds, and uh, Norman did very well <coughs> the other night, but uh, Francie Malloy, DUP never showed up, 
and uh, Francis Malloy was doing a Pontius Pilate and said, well, this is not a Sinn Féin document. He was trying to distance himself from it. So the message is starting to get through, and at a recent CRC conference in the Stormont Hotel in uh, Belfast, I must say, I quite enjoyed uh, Bernadette Michaliski uh, telling Martine Anderson what the principles of republicanism were, and I'd given her a definition for cohesion, sharing, and integration. Nobody else needed to speak after that. Um, because the, the, it really is about uh, individuals and organisations collectively and society as a whole saying to Sinn Féin and the DUP who are the authors of this paper that it simply is not good enough and it will not do. We've waited almost two years for the publication of this document. People will recall the only reason this document is on the table was to get uh, that ever principled person, David Ford, over the line to the Justice Ministry post. And this is what uh, the Lions Party seemed to have bought a pig and a pup, a poke really, uh, in relation to this particular document. It really is not up to standard, but it is very scary because uh, at a debate in the Assembly Chamber, Martina Anderson said that good relations was acceptable, was acceptable, not essential. Equality, she said, was essential, good relations, desirable, the desirable, acceptable criteria. But that's all the far they were going to go in it. But we're already seeing the two parties starting to drift away from uh, uh, ownership of this paper. And I think that's what we need to continue to do, to change them on it. Um, I could just say that... Uh, Trying to think in terms of uh, this document, what others have said is very clear. This is the one and only chance. Billions of pounds, as Duncan has said, has gone into many of the areas we all represent, and yet how much better are the lives of those people that live in those areas? So I would challenge you, uh, you to come and say to me, people are living much happier, better lives, and much more settled and free from fear and suspicion as a result of the millions and or hundreds of thousands poured into interface areas. And uh, Sinn Féin and the DUP really do need to be challenged over this. And that, this is the that I was going to say. Uh, at, at all of the public hearings in, in, in the consultation, Sinn Féin and the DUP sent out officials like lambs to, this, uh, to the wolves to articulate the vision of this document. This document was written by the advisors for Sinn Féin and the DUP. And Sinn Féin tried to say it's based on equality. Well, they actually sold out on equality even within this document because it is gender blind. And, it, uh, and at, uh, also at that assembly debate, uh, the junior minister, Robert Newton, said that it's really not for the uh, uh, GLBT sector. You know, their, their turn, Libby will come around 2012. So Sinn Féin sold out on sections of equality in order to get this document on the table, and it really is not good enough. Thank you, Doris. Um, are there roving mics in the room? Can I just check? Uh, do colleagues have any mics? Yeah, they're there, are they? Go. Pat Convery, Lord Mayor Belfast. I would just uh, <coughs> like to ask the panel, how, with our vision on a shared society, can we get to a situation whereby the likes of the violence that we have and interfaces whenever we have them, and we still have them, and some people think that we can just do without them. The reality is that they're there, and we have to put in all the effort that you're talking about and the panel are talking about to build those relationships that people feel safe. But how can we challenge the uh, way that government is looking at interfaces when it comes to the summers? There was talk there about interface violence. But we now have a situation where we are giving out money to ensure that there won't be violence by taking young people, especially, away from local communities for the day whenever there's a parade on. Now, I feel that that is us, uh, and when I say us as a government, turning around and rewarding a threat of potential violence or saying we won't, or we don't want you in the area to ensure there's not violence. I think we should be trying to, to do more work with youth work, with uh, cross-community work, and a situation of putting on events in local communities at the time of these parades, so that people are diverted away, and subsequently, if they behave, that they might get some reward. Not the other way around, it seems to be, in school you want to reward a child for being misbehaving, 
but it's the behave that it wasn't together work. And I think that for too long now, we're just dishing out money and it has become a funding stream. We, we dish out money at interfaces for workers, large amounts of money for salaries. They work from September to the end of June, and in July and others, they seem to go on holiday and everybody else is mad. Anyone want to take that one? Yep, go ahead, okay. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I have to agree with you. I think one of the, the big um, problems we have at the moment is we don't have a serious youth strategy at all. Uh, what we have actually is a system which is essentially creaking at the edges. It's a Cinderella. And yet when you go to communities, particularly communities in the inner city or, or in, 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 in some of the towns as well or, uh, around the states, they will say to you, the issue of how we cope with young people is perhaps the biggest one. And one of the difficulties we have with the CSI document actually is that it seems to treat this, first of all it says the young people are the problem. Actually our view is the symptom of young people is the problem is a symptom of failure of, of, of what we're doing. And so we would say, first of all, we need a review to look at exactly what are we doing for young people. This issue of throwing money at, at interfaces, uh, to be honest with you, in the last five years, every single summer we end up in the same place. A couple of months, everybody starts to panic around certain situations which are particularly volatile, and money then can only be thrown in because there isn't a plan. But the bottom line is we need to have long relationships with young people built there so that exactly the kind of thing that Pat's talking about, we're, we're actually engaging people in their own programs and diversions, it's already there. The, other aspect, I suppose, of, of that is, you know something, we run a system where our schools and our uh, youth services are shut during most of the summer months. <laughs> uh, and we, in a time of cuts, are going to have to rethink about schools in such a way and the facilities and the local facilities that we have. Are, could we find a way to make those available year-round to people? Because some of the kind of what you call diversionary stuff is useful, for example, might be sport. Sport's been an extremely useful thing at times for people to say, you know, I'd rather do that. But if all the games fields are actually closed during the summer or there's no youth workers to look after them or we have insurance problems in terms of opening these things, we're not actually getting best value out of this kind of stuff. So in terms of sheer economics, we need to be looking at what's that. And if I was to say that one thing, I would say to the youth strategy is a, is, a, is a really important one. Last thing I would say to you is this, is on the issue of interfaces. Interfaces are a scandal because essentially what they say is we can't keep you safe unless we build a 70 foot massive permanent construction at the bottom of your garden. And you know something, that is a failure of our, us as a society to make a fundamental guarantee to people, which is you're safe, you know, because you're safe, because this is a community which keeps you safe. And so what I would say to you is this is, of course, and I want to be really clear, nobody anywhere near the community relations council says just take down walls and leave people. Absolutely not. But it is absolutely critical that in a, in a, in a community safety strategy that we name that we will not have succeeded until we've got to the point where people can live safely in their houses without these things. And it is a state and government responsibility not to pull things down without people's permission, but to drive a debate and to find ideas as to how we are going to do that. And that is a fundamental challenge for political leadership. So I would say to you, to finish with two things. One, we need to say, this is a scandal which we accept has been come out of our past and we want to get them down, but we want to start working on how we're going to make people safe because safety is the first priority. And the second one is that for young people, we need an investment in young people which isn't just about throwing money at them when we think they're going to be a problem, but an investment in young people which says, this is the kind of future we want and we're engaging you in the process. Norman and then Colin. But I want to hear clearly from the nationalist and republican community that the culture that is so important to loyalists, unionists and protestant matters. It is not merely something to be managed. And I want to hear from the loyalist and unionist community that when they express themselves in ways that are a problem to Catholic and nationalist people, that they are concerned about the expression of that. Now, 
this is a responsibility, to, it seems to me in the first instance, for political and social leadership. If, if I cannot hear from the folks on the other side that who I am matters and hear it consistently, 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 what imperative is there, what even desire is there in me to be even nice to you? And I mean, we are known as a sort of key millefoil of a place of a hundred thousand welcomes. I want somebody to say to my community a hundred thousand welcomes to your community and your culture. And I want to find a mechanism of saying a hundred thousand welcomes to your culture. Now, I know the number of politicians here and, and I, I, I genuinely have been, I'm always extremely restrained. In, in being critical of politicians because you guys have an electorate to, to satisfy every year virtually, I don't so I, I'm very conscious of that but there is a specific responsibility on the elected leadership to model and to mentor hospitality, welcome, respect in public all the time so that the folks who aren't hearing it at the moment begin to get the message. Thank you, Norman. It, it says in your eyes. Uh, I was just observing, it says in New Ireland for all on the banner behind us. I think there is a challenge for us to explain what we mean. Colin, you wanted to, to say a few words. I, just to widen it out again and bring back in the the social justice agenda to this. If there's something that's shared across interfaces and shared across barriers, it's profound socioeconomic disadvantage. And I'd like to, to, to stress that. Um, in a sense, the mindset that Pat uh, identified is essentially a mindset about propping up a profoundly unequal society. Now, there are aspects of that propping up in a post-conflict context that are entirely understandable. But if we are going to shift the conversation to a conversation about what sort of society we want to live in, we have to name it for what it is. At the moment, a number of mechanisms that are in place are simply propping up inequality in this society. And that inequality, as all the current research points to, creates unhappy societies, it creates unhealthy societies, and ultimately it maintains, establishes, and fosters a divided societies as well. Now, when law gets mentioned, when rights gets mentioned, when equality gets mentioned, everyone automatically thinks about courts. When we bring in socioeconomic disadvantage and poverty and we mention rights, people think of courts. But some of the leading work in the area of social justice at the moment is looking precisely at Duncan's point. It's looking at economics, it's looking at budgets, it's looking at the budget process. Politicians often make high sounding speeches about social justice about anti-poverty, but what some of the groundbreaking work in rights and equality and social justice at the moment is looking at, is looking at the budget process, looking at the economics of it, are, are we doing what we say we are doing through the tools at our disposal, for example, through the budget process, and I would underline today that that's one we need to keep a very, very close eye on uh, as we go forward over the next few years. But my premise, I suppose, is a premise about inequality. Unequal societies are unhappy, unhealthy, and they're divided societies. And Colin, just, just to be clear about what you mean when you say inequality, because it's become a bit of a, another one of those peace process phases. You're not just talking about sectarian inequality, are you? You're talking about socioeconomic divisions too. <coughs> Two things I, I think I'd like to, 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 to highlight in relation to this, absolutely called socio-economic disadvantage needs to be more and more thought of in equality terms. Anti-poverty strategies need to be thought of uh, in equality terms, and that's absolutely
absolutely vital and important to, to what I'm saying this morning. As I look across to my left and see the one, two, three, four, five men and one woman, uh, the second key element in that is, and one remember that did find its way into the Good Friday Agreement, is the participation of women in public life. And if I was to underline a second major issue uh, confronting this society at the moment, it is gender equality. I'm just going to make a mischievous uh, comment. Do, do you mind if I throw it over again? There's quite a number of people asking to ask, but I wouldn't mind throwing Peter Gibson was next uh, to show hands. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, Peter Gibson from North Down. This process is, is, part, is largely about the SDLP developing a new approach uh, about the shared society for, for the benefit of the party and for its all. And I'm, I'm hoping that you look, look forward to a bit of a barbecue with some sacred cows in this process. And, or maybe fixing metaphors elephants in the room. And I think one of the elephants in the room in Northern Ireland has got to be um, segregated education. And I think we have to have a hard look at that. Now, segregated education is, is related to uh, segregated society as a whole. But I, I, I think that I would put the challenge to, and I speak within the SDLP as someone uh, who, who doesn't hold uh, any uh, of the conventional religious beliefs uh, and, and uh, you know, believes that really uh, the, the role of religion in schooling is that children should be taught about the Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition that we have, but that the churches should not be involved in providing schools uh, either directly or as transferable. So I, I'm asking perhaps the, the, the outside members of the panel as to wh whether they feel that, uh, you know, that segregated education is an issue that needs to be addressed and that perhaps we do need some uh, radical approaches within the SDLP and in our society in that. Good, fair question. Who would like, like to take that role in the hub? Uh, might as well take it. <laughs> <laughs> <Sounds good. laughs> Why not ask the easy question? Why not ask the hard questions? Um, okay. Uh, I'm speaking uh, in this case of where the Community Relations Council has, has, has come to on the question of education. It's our view that the critical question in practical terms is that we absolutely have to stop educating sites. Uh, that at some level or other we have to generate something different at the end from them and us. Uh, however, it's our view that in practical terms what that looks like doesn't mean just to say just roll across existing schools which people have or they, they think are important to them. But that um, we, there are loads of opportunities for us to uh, think about how, at the end, the critical issue, which is how children are brought to uh, adulthood in a society in which they recognise the value of both themselves and others, is a central priority, must be a central priority for all educators. Now, I have to say, our great moment was um, the Bain report, because we believe that in something which looked like it was about, uh, about school estate, offered a whole load of opportunities. All of a sudden, instead of integrated schools, certainly are an important model and an important element of the whole system. Absolutely essential. But an integrated school must be a genuinely shared school. It mustn't feel like the occupation of one by the other. So the question of what an integrated school looks like is important. It's not just integrated because everybody's in it. It has to be integrated because everybody feels like it's a warm home for them. So be very clear about that. The second thing is that there are huge opportunities, for example, in sharing through the curriculum. In the curricular entitlement framework that is there now, why, if we have a context of one having very good language facilities, one having one school very close by, having very good science facilities, in the context of cuts, why is it not possible for us to share those, particularly as people go up the school system? In a context where village schools are having to close, and we're talking about busing half the community from one place to another, is it not possible for us to start talking about jointly managed schools? In the context of Listen Alley in Oma, is it not possible, and it looks as if it may well be possible, to have a shared campus where core facilities are shared, such as sports facilities and so on? In thinking through the curriculum, how can we not think around stuff like history, religious education, cultural and arts, sport, and so on, these things which divide us, but also in the ordinary things which don't divide us, like maths and physics, that we can actually have people alongside. And then maybe finally, that there are ladders also in the age group. 
that people feel differently about their four-year-old, their eleven-year-old, their fifty, their their fourteen-year-old, their eighteen-year-old. But possibly we should be looking at a system which puts people more and more into shared education as they become older. That there are all sorts of different possibilities. There are already examples. Limavady has some very interesting examples. Ballycastle has some interesting examples. There are interesting examples moving in Oman. We need to look at what the opportunities of the time are. We certainly need to move to a system in which we understand all of the children belong to all of us. All of the children belong to all of us. And we have a responsibility to everyone that no child should go to school to be educated in a way which sees the, anybody outside their school as an enemy. And that beyond that, there are real opportunities planned through the curriculum and in the practical structures of the society to move us into real and meaningful engagement so that when we come out, we also know each other. Anyone else want to pick up on that one? No. I think it would be remiss of the moderator of the Presbyterian Church not to respond to that one. Um, we would actually agree look, substantially with what uh, Duncan has just said. Um, there are, as we all know, important uh, sort of major considerations around this because very, very large sections of the community as parents are making choices about, at the moment, about who they want to provide an education for their children. And no matter what uh, the, the great and the good may say, choices are being made at the moment which uh, reinforce the fact that we are not yet desirous of integrating the education of our children. Now, as a church, we are very open, the Presbyterian Church, we are very open to whatever new models can be produced that will, uh, that will result in integrating our education in whatever way those are. But there is, it seems to me there is one, uh, there's a little elephant in the room, there's only a little elephant in the room, but I think he or she may grow uh, over the coming years. State education does not happen in some value-free neutral environment. There is no such thing as value-free education. So as part of unpacking what it means to have our children integrated or, or, or educated together, uh, there will be an intense debate, an intense debate about the ethos of that education. And certainly uh, I do not want to even begin to accept that a secular education is value free. So there are complicated ethos issues as well as personal and family decision choices in this debate. Oh. I, I want to widen this out because I think the question was, was framed in the context of, of the SDLP and what the SDLP can do in this debate, but I would broaden that out more generally. Um, again, harking back to the, the, the 40 years of, of the party, uh, the SDLP as a political party was born by breaking the mould. The SDLP broke the mould with that politics in the north and created and forged a new path uh, and a new politics. And I think, you know, if you were to have that conversation, obviously it's a good place to have it at the SDLP party conferences, that in a range of areas, including in education, uh, the SDLP, as it has always been, is, is, is the shaper of the debate, is breaking new ground and forging a new path and forging a new politics. That's, that's, that's how it was born and you know, hopefully that's how the SDLP will continue. Doris? Uh, in the audience will have heard earlier this morning, uh, Dominic Bradley did outline the party's commitment to building a, a shared education and actually taken part in the debate and was the only party that represents the nationalist community to actually do so. And we, we are not afraid and will not shy away from uh, those debates, nor will we uh, allow others to characterise uh, Catholic education, which has stood the test of time and actually served many of us very well. And one of the things, conference, if you were if you're arriving in a little late, you, if you go to conference box, motion seven this morning, uh, actually, uh, conference voted to uh, support the principle of shared faith schools. And I think this is a challenge for us all because it is about building on the very positive aspects of ethos-based education, which we hold so true, and so many of us have benefited from. But it's also an even bigger challenge because currently today, 
the Catholic education sector technically has nobody to share with of a, 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 another ethos. So there's a huge legislative challenge there. Can I ask the lady in the third row, if we can get the microphone up in the front, the signal she wants to ask a question. It was just when you were talking about parades, at one stage, Catholic education was during one of the wars, and I don't know if it's World Wars, all parades were stopped in the north for a long time. So I think now is the time to stop all parades, it doesn't matter what it's about, and let the people on either side then get together and work out something for them while you people are all doing the work that you're doing now. That's, that's the only way I can think okay. about the parades. <coughs> Radical suggestion, should we have a parade amnesty to create the space to be able to start a different type of conversation? Could I ask if the lady wants to stop trade unions parades against cuts in, cuts in public expenditure? All, all parades, all parades for right. All public demonstrations. Well, I, I doubt if there would be much support from the trade union movement for banning parades protesting against cuts. I mean, that again is the management of fear, because all it would do it would be suppress the, uh, the aspirations of people to, to express their views in public. Now, I understand the rationale for it, but it doesn't seem to me that suppressing people's legitimate right to protest or to parade is a way of actually building a shared society. It just, it's like taking Valium, or, or worse. And you know, Tom, I, I don't want to drag you into the specific question, but back to the question of respect, isn't it? Because if, if we can create a context in which people can celebrate their identity in a positive way, in a, in a context of respect, where they feel that they are getting respect, but they are also able to show it, then you can, you can allow positive demonstrations of culture to continue without having to try and, and eliminate them. So I'm wondering, looking at it from the GA perspective, and maybe coming back to an earlier point about uh, Colin and social exclusion, the fact that there is so much that needs and must be done at, in the most deprived communities to promote that cultural respect. Yes, and I, I suppose, uh, uh, first of all, just in relation to the general point, in, in relation to education structures and so on, I suppose if we wait uh, for all of that to be settled and changed, I think there is a missed opportunity in terms of working on the whole business of developing uh, mutual understanding and respect. And I think within the existing system, uh, there, there's huge potential to, 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 to do a lot of work with the existing uh, cultural organisations, sporting organisations and so on, to give them an opportunity maybe to educate in relation to where they're coming from. And we would get very, very few requests uh, other than maybe initiatives that we take ourselves uh, to get involved in that kind of action uh, in, in, in the education sector. Just in relation to the whole uh, issue, I suppose, of, of deep uh, uh, deprivation and disadvantage and the very strong pockets of that that exist, um, uh, in society here. Uh, we have had the experience where the Department of Social Development, when Margaret Ritchie was member, <coughs> asked us to get involved in a, a very big project in Ballymurphy. Uh, there were three existing GA clubs in that area, O'Donnell, St John's and Gort Namona, uh, but they were really only scratching the surface in terms of uh, participation levels. And over the past three years, the GA at national levels put 400,000 into that area employed uh, a, a community development worker, a coach and so on, and, and we have found that we have had a, a tremendous response from the youth of the area and, and a, 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 a huge increase in the involvement of young girls in the playing of Gaelic games in, 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 in that particular society. They have now uh, linked in uh, uh, with their respective clubs, uh, developing a sense of, of uh, uh, community involvement uh, and, and identity. I suppose the, the, the challenge for us into the future is how do we sustain that. That's a funded pilot project and I know that many organisations involved in all sectors I suppose of, of, of uh, 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 the voluntary community development end of things here face that all the time where uh, things are funded on, on a, a fixed term basis. What do you do when the pilot ends? How do you sustain the activity? How do you your volunteer base uh, sufficiently uh, 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 developed in order to, uh, to bring the work forward and that's a challenge that we're hoping to uh, address through a, 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 a bigger strategy for uh, the development of uh, the GA in Belfast. But I would have to say that again our experience has been that when the effort was made, when the resources were put in, 
that the community responded, and I think that it has had um, very positive benefits. Thanks, John. Anne McQuillan is showing, and I have another gentleman down the back, and we're in now the last few questions. So, anyone wants to ask a question, please get your hand up for me. Anne McQuillan. Uh, thank you. I'm Anne McQuillan from Vermont, Bernie's Church. I just want to say, when I was educated at a convent school, and of course, in my day, which is some time ago, we weren't aware of any great intolerance. I never was aware of any great intolerance. But I did like the ethos of the school. I wouldn't like to see the Christian ethos vanishing from schools. Uh, the one thing that I wonder uh, uh, is about history, the teaching of history in shared schools. In shared schools. How does that go down? Because nationalist people really have one view of history and unionist people have another. And uh, how do you get them to come together? I'm not quite sure. Well, I might do if it's okay to take a couple more. Is that Rosemary Fanning and Dan Black? Yeah. Rosemary, just stand here. And then I'll take you to as well. If that's okay, then we can throw that back to me. Yeah. Rosemary Fanning and Ellis Skillen. Obviously, the panel, like the SDLP, believe that the CSI document is totally flawed. Perhaps they also agree with the SDLP that reconciliation must start within the side of the government. So what does the panel believe that the essential next step is for this process, which impacts on every aspect of our attempts to improve as a society, and to progress the socio-economic issues, which we cannot successfully tackle without solving the basic issues of division within our society? Thanks, Rosalie. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Anne Shard and Nuria Moore. Um, I've just got a question for the panel. Um, I've started a little project recently with uh, four schools at each side of the community in the South Armagh and Morn. Uh, and it's been a very interesting process for me. Uh, basically why I'm doing it is just to open up the forum in a small way so that uh, people would start talking to each other that wouldn't normally meet each other at all. Concentrating on the age group between seven and nine and it's taken me two and a half months to get the eight schools on board. Now, the trying to be unbiased here, um, the nationalist community, the teachers came on board straight away, but they had to get approval from certain people in their community. And I managed to get that, that was okay. The other part of the community, uh, Connor, I really resonated with what you said total fear. It resonated on the phone from the head teachers. They went to the panels, there was fear from the panels, absolute fear from the parents. And um, everybody on the panel here today has absolutely represented just this tiny little project. They represented exactly what I found. Anyway, the good story is uh, my eighth teacher came on board yesterday. And uh, we'll be starting at the end of the month. And um, it's going to be video conferencing in the schools where the kids will actually talk to each other. And it'll just, it'll be an, an option for them to talk freely without the parents getting upset and distressed that they'll be actually physically in the same space. But I'm also planning a fun day and I'm hoping Tom to get the GAA involved. Trevor Ringland is definitely going to be supporting it, as many other charities in Northern Ireland. And um, hopefully by then, the parents would be begging to come to the fun day. So, um, getting back to the fear, uh, subject of fear, it's very, very, very prevalent. And uh, I'm really glad that you're doing work in that area. And um, SDLP certainly is uh, a party that wants a shared society. I get that big time. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Jenny, we'll give, you, we'll give you the last question, if you wouldn't mind squeezing it in, and then we'll try and get around the panel and wrap this one up. Okay. Separate and equal, but equal. Uh, in relation to housing, we are more divided than ever territorially. And for all the reasons that we have uh, been raised today, fear and so on. But how in practical terms can we get uh, shared housing started? Oh, yeah. Is that Bobby Locker? It is? Okay, I'm just going to probably squeeze in and then that will be the last question for this session and then we'll allow the panelists to respond. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Bobby Locker, the panel said to him. As regards to one of the old grades, <coughs> I remember the age of order by Bernie's, where I fight with the county under president. The age of order by Bernie's was created to protect the Catholic faith years and years ago. 
and uh, we in the ancient world are very rich. We do pray, we pray for we want it. We do pray for we don't want it. So, as regards to the ancient world are very rich, Kate and Tobin and Northern Ireland, we're not guilty. Thanks, Bobby. What we're going to do is, we'll catch up on that, pick up whatever bits you want, uh, and we'll try and wrap it up in about seven or eight minutes. Yeah, we're totally against it. Who wants to kick off really quickly now? Dolores. But just on the issue of uh, the shared housing, and uh, I know that uh, Margaret, my minister, and now Alex is taking the lead in terms of trying to create shared spaces in, in, in as much as they can within their areas of responsibility. I met yesterday with our local housing executive manager who uh, was explaining how the central area of Craig Avon is going to be uh, working towards a shared neighbourhood scheme which will actually have inbuilt a uh, good relations strategy and charter and that all people will subscribe to. In parts of uh, Bad Bridgeville, part of my constituency, I think Margaret opened a shared housing scheme where people actually sign up to certain standards of behaviour and this is the area that we want to live. In, but the people who are going to live in those areas, it's about others coming and posing or departmental officials. It's actually about having a conversation with people about the type of neighbourhood and the ideology around that. And that's something that SDLP uh, Minister, both Margaret and Alex, have been taking the lead in. And I know that Margaret uh, had held 14 workshops right across the north and having a debate uh, with uh, uh, all uh, individuals and, and organisations about shared. Uh, society, what they want to see. I just want to commend you on your work. And, and, and I'm sure Norman, I've seen him nodding his head whenever he said about the fear in the Protestant community because I have worked as a, in, in community organisations where we were just taking young people from rural areas to the swimming pool and the bus was packed with young people in the Catholic community and very few in the Protestant community. And there is a, a lack of confidence in the Protestant community that we have to. Uh, acknowledge and then try to work a, a way through in terms of building their confidence and actually working across the side. Thanks, Doris. And really quickly, anyone else want to pick up a final word? Don't yeah. Do you know I can go through the lot of these things. I, one of the most interesting things I did in the last couple of years, I went to Chicago and went into Mayor Daly's office and it said, Chicago, city of parades. And <laughs> uh, in a sense, what he was saying was, success looks like we can use this space for all of us, it just doesn't belong to any of us on our own. So the core question is always, I understand what people say here, I don't want the parades. The question always you should ask is, do you want my parades or my demonstrations banned? So we have a big issue. I do think it's our absolute priority to be really clear that we have to separate cultural separation from intimidation. And until that happens, then it will be extremely difficult to deal with this question, but it is an imperative question. I really have only two points no, I want to no, say. No, no, I, don't, don't, I'm going to cut you off I there. have to say one more. I have to say one more. It's, it's an answer to the back <laughs> there. And it answers this one here. I, in my work before I did this job, this question of Catholic participation versus Protestant not participation across community activities came up. And the guy said to me, yes, they used to, all, all the Catholics would turn up until you said it was going to be run by the RUC. And then... <laughs> <laughs> and the point I'm making is that... The, uh, the, the, the legacy of history is not the same across our communities. The, the profound, as I understand it, and I don't want to lecture to anybody, but my experience of this is the nationalist community's profound experience is of discrimination and exclusion and of a, a sense that Britain was the enemy. My experience of the Protestant community is profoundly that they deeply fear that there is a, a project of their cultural, if not personal, annihilation inside nationalism. And if you ask me what the, 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 the things that have to happen, really have to happen is, on, if you like the unionist process, that I would like to see an unambiguous commitment to equality and to mean it. And if I was asking nationalism, I would ask nationalism to say, to examine whether there is a space in your future for people who still want to call themselves British. Fantastic point, Dan. Colin, really briefly. Really Two points. <laughs> Just two quick points to, to, to Hoover on a number of the questions that were asked. First of all, in relation to the debate around ethos, I'd just be totally you know, candid about this. I think those involved in the rights, equality, and social justice debate need to be much more humble about the origins of the concepts that they use, and that includes their theological basis as well. You can't talk about human rights 
without recognizing the origins of some of those concepts, point one. And point two, I think this covers a number of issues that were raised in the questions. What we're struggling with at the moment is the utter failure in this society to create a compelling vision for our future. But not just create a compelling vision for a future, but to achieve that vision inclusively. It's no good achieving that compelling vision with four people locked in a room and everyone else locked outside the room. Achieving that compelling vision needs to be done inclusively. Second, we need milestones along the way as to how we're going to get there and we need the tools in place to achieve it. The CSI document, let's be frank, first of all, is an appallingly written document. Secondly, it's like sliding down a glass building. How are we ever going to get anywhere on the basis of that document? So there is an utter need at the moment for something that sets out a compelling vision of our shared future, anchored in rights, equality, social justice and right relationships, but most importantly, how we are going to get there so that over the next 40 years we might actually arrive. Thank you, Colin. There's loads I could say, but since you're a good chairman, you'll not allow me to. Um, Are you finished? <laughs> I'm looking for a free cup of tea, actually. Um, really, two things. One about parades and one on a, on, a, on a bigger thing. I mean, the phrase, and please take this the right way, that some group doesn't walk where they're not, where they're not wanted, actually articulates the problem. Why are they not wanted? What needs to happen to make them wanted? So for me, it is absolutely not an answer to say only have your own culture expressed in your own area. That is simply managing division. The, the, second, thing I uh, the second thing I think I would say is that uh, in, in putting together a shared vision for the future, uh, all of us, and I know this sounds really twee, it, it, it's as big a challenge to those of us in the church sector as in civic society or political sector. I actually need to build a relationship with the folks in the SDLP so that I can hear where you guys are at and you, and I've spent the last week in Uri and more, and I'm back there tomorrow morning at the end of a week's visit to the, you know, to, to the area. I have heard the most horrendous personal stories of fear and intimidation from Protestant people in Uri and more. And I, and I am really struggling, having heard some awful stories this week, as to how I bridge the gap between the stories I have heard and a healthy society in Uri and more. And I need your guys' help, your help to do it, but you also need to hear from me as I, well. I feel terrible having to cut you short, but I think Norman deserves a tremendous round of applause. <laughs> we're, we're an extra time done. <laughs> I don't want to get a red card, but I mean, just... Uh, I suppose in overall terms, I think that one of the things in relation to strategy is it's very, very aspirational. And, uh, you know, how do you bridge the gap between that and between people who want to do practical things on the ground? I believe that one of the great uh, mistakes we keep making is reinventing the wheel in terms of community development and so on. We, we, we need to engage the organisations that are already well established in this agenda, get them to buy in and let them become a vehicle uh, for moving this agenda forward in, in their own areas and in adjoining areas with the, and, and with communities that they haven't worked with previously. Conference, we have made a little bit of history and I think uh, we should pick up the challenge that Colin Harvey set us, which is to go back to our roots, to our radicalness, to our campaigning spirit, to our utter and unequivocal commitment to civil and human rights, to freedom and to progressive <laughs> politics. I just want to thank you all. And I